a lead detective on a new case, you know that you got multiple confessions from this jailhouse informant in the past that have helped you solve dozens of crimes. The issue is, his testimonies might have been the only evidence in your case. Now a man is sitting on a death row for 30 years claiming his innocence, and one victim's family is still unsure whether justice has been served. I think the girl in the back wants to say something. What was it, girl in the back? Did you choose to speak about him because he is as obsessed with his first name as you are? Eye roll moment? No. I chose to talk about this guy because of how much damage he has done. He has had almost nine wives, and for a substantial amount of time in his life, he even went under the name Jason Bourne. Yeah before he was Matt Damon. And you think it's just because he's as obsessed with his first name as I am. I mean, he did go under Jason Paul Bourne. <laughs> so yes, that might be a bit of a part of why I chose to talk about this guy, but don't let it get into your head, girl in the back, okay? You don't know me. You don't know me like that. I actually do know you, because this is not a Katie Ups video. I am you. I am a product of your imagination. Okay, then. A bit debatable, but good Katia preference there, good one, good one. <laughs> I'm gonna put all of this into the outtakes because she is right. There is nobody here watching me, <laughs> quite like in Katia's videos. I am here by myself and the girl in the back is truly just a product of my imagination. Why did you just look at her like she is actually there? Do you need to be hospitalized? Do you need to be institutionalized? Okay, yeah. We put in the takeouts and outtakes timestamp. You shall see how this is produced professionally in a studio with you know, real equipment and all of that. Mm -hmm. For now, though, Maya is the name. <laughs> Crazy is the freaking game. Gone Bad is the game of the day. We are talking about a guy named Paul Skalnik. That, as you witness that conversation with my imaginary self, uh, did a lot of damage. Yeah. He put dozens of people in jail, four people on death row because of him, and we are going to be talking about one particular case today, but I will be mentioning here and there like other cases that he contributed on, just so you understand the extent this man went to. By this point, you know that I am a slut for a couple of things. 2020s on ABC, true crime podcasts, and this somehow combines it all. Because only the true fans will know that I actually mentioned speaking on expert testimonies or just like looking into eyewitness testimonies and why do we trust expert testimonies so much and that weird thing where they can go to school for like a couple of weeks and then testify as an expert like in a murder trial like it's a freaking joke. Yeah, I don't know which exact case I mentioned this on, but I was very impressionable because I listened to this podcast I'm gonna put on the screen, Tenfold More Wicked, and that same podcast featured Paul Skalnik in one of their episodes. I was like, I need to look into this guy. So here on this channel, I'm gonna be talking about Paul Skalnik. If you want free extra cases, for free on different eyewitness, witness, expert testimonies that put innocent people behind bars, I would highly suggest you subscribe to my podcast channel, by all means necessary, on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts, because it is in audio and video form as well. Because bitch loves structure. But now, without further ado, my is the name. Gone Bad is the game. Gone Bad is this series that I do on this very channel. You're in the right place, right time, where I sit on my fat ass and I tell you a story about a person that has lived a normal life, you know, even a bit boring, you could say, and then one day they just decided to flip a switch and switch to crime. And we are all wondering, like, why? How does this happen? Could it happen to me? That was the inspiration behind it. So, having that in mind, let us dive into the case of Shelley Borgio and the jailhouse snitch that was Paul Skalnik. Our story begins with Detective John Halliday. This guy was 35 at the time, in 1986, and he had about a decade of policing in the Pinellas County, which is just west of Tampa in Florida. There was a case that John worked on about a year and a half ago that is still haunting him. So, on this day, he went into prison in order to speak with some prison inmates. In this case, two perpetrators were supposedly involved. 
One was called Jack Piercy and the other one James Daly. Jack Piercy's trial already took place and he was convicted to life in prison, but they were still awaiting for Daly's trial. So on this day, when John visited the prison, he asked different jailers and prison guards to bring him the inmates that were placed in the cells near these two guys that they have convicted. One by one, these prison inmates were taken into a small room where Halliday was waiting. He was pressing each and every one of these men for information. Has Percy confessed to anything? Has Daly confessed and ever talked about this case? Have any of them ever admitted to anything to you? Because the Boggio case that he has worked on a year and a half ago desperately needed a jailhouse snitch. A year and a half ago, John was called to a crime scene where a body of a 14-year-old girl named Shelley Boggio was found nude, floating in the waterway near the town of Indian Rocks Beach. The medical examiner would report that Shelley had 18 different defensive wounds on her hands, that she was beaten, that she was choked and stabbed a total of 31 times. But they also determined that her actual cause of death was drowning, as if she was held underwater until she stopped breathing. The body in itself, because of all of these wounds, was in such a bad shape that this medical examiner couldn't even determine if she was sexually assaulted or not. And another thing that you need to take into consideration is that the body was found in water, and she was in this water for a period of time. So if there was any DNA, that would have been washed away by this point. So even in terms of crime scene, the murder weapon wasn't found, there was no DNA evidence whatsoever. There are many things in this case that probably scarred you as a detective, one of them being that Shelley was actually stabbed and endured 30 stab wounds, so she was still alive when she was dragged into the water for somebody to drown her and to end her life. And the second part is that her sister was the one that identified her because of this silver eagle-shaped ring that Shelley would always wear on her left hand. So who was Shelley Borgio and what details do we know for sure about that night? In May of 1985, Shelley was 14 years old. She had just moved to live with her father, her twin sister and their older sister to Indian Rocks Beach from Michigan. I couldn't find much about the circumstances of why Shelley and her family have moved from Michigan. I could only find that it wasn't in the best of conditions, that they only had just the clothes that they put on their bags that they put into the rucksack, so they weren't really a well-off family. And in terms of schooling, Shelley was enrolled into this new school in Florida, but she ended up missing 67 days of classes, so she dropped out. Even before Shelley dropped out of school, she would go with her sisters to this beach. She would be hitchhiking by the pathway around it. And by doing this, she met a couple of locals, some of them not really of her age or of the age that would be appropriate for a 14-year-old to hang out with. But ever since she dropped out of school, this was kind of like a regular occurrence every Sunday. Instead of maybe just, I don't know, sitting at home, doing the last bits of homework, Shelley would be outside with her sisters, with her friends, with the people that she trusted. So this morning, she went to the beach around 11 a.m. Around 3 p.m., they decided to leave the beach and kind of like hitchhike in the area. And here, a person picked them up, asking them if they can get him some weed, like, for 30 bucks. And Shelly and her sister were like, yeah, yeah, of course, let's, let's just drive you here, so, like, just give us the money, and we definitely have this pot dealer that will give you some weed. But they just ran out of the car with 30 bucks, and they were like, fuck it, <laughs> like, loser, why did you give us the money before we actually gave you the weed? At this point, it was Shelly, Stacy, her twin sister, and their friend Stephanie. So they're just running, trying to escape this guy so he doesn't catch them, and they split these $30 free ways. And at that very moment, there's a car passing by with two guys inside the car that they know because they hung out on the beach before with them. One guy's name is Jack Piercy, and the other one's James Daly. 
According to Stacy, after Piercy and Daly picked them up, they stopped by this convenience store to buy six packs of wine coolers and beers. They drove around, as they always did, drinking and smoking some pot, and that is when Oza Shaw, the other guy that was in the car, asks to be dropped off back at where he was staying with Piercy and Daly. After they drop him off, Daly, Piercy, and the three girls now go to the bar to continue partying, and at this point, it was getting dark. After this bar, the group kind of thought, okay, let's do some bar hopping, let's go to the next one. But either these girls didn't have their IDs on them, or I read in a different report that the IDs were fake. So the bouncer at this bar kind of just checked their IDs and turned them back. And it's at this point that they go back to where PRC and Daly were staying. Here they smoked some more pot, they watched a movie, and Stacy and Stephanie were kind of done for the night. It was about 10 p.m. and they were like, hey, can you just like drop us off home? And the guy said, no problem. But Shelly still wanted the night to continue. And so did Percy's pregnant girlfriend, Gail Bailey, at the time. So they decide to go to yet another bar after dropping Stephanie and Stacy off. Up until this point, the story is told from Stacy's perspective. It is her account of events. And as you can see, the story flows. It just seems natural. Now, the story switches, because Stacy and Stephanie were dropped off, to Gail Daly's point of view, because she was the one that will testify about the account of events from now on. Let's see if that story flows as well, because according to me, kind of seems like... Seems like she didn't really tell us all. According to Gail, Percy, Daly, herself, and Shelly were now in this disco bar where their fake IDs work. They danced, they enjoyed themselves. Shelly apparently danced with Percy at the club, but not Daly. And then they decide to go back to where all of them lived. So not to drop Shelly back off at hers, but rather all together go back to that house. Once they walked into the house that Daly and Percy and all of them shared, Oza Show, the friend that was staying with all of them, woke up and he asked to be driven to the nearest payphone, to use a payphone and like call his girlfriend. I don't really know in the story who he was about to give a call to, but now we switch to his perspective and his account of events. Because as he is waking up, he sees Jack Percy already kind of at the door, leaving with Shelly, as if to drop her off home. So he's like, hey, can you just bring me around to this payphone? I need to make a call. And sure, Jack says yes, because he's already driving in that direction. Why not? So at the payphone, Oza seems to be taking some time. So Jack just says, like, listen, can you, like, walk home on foot? Like, I just want to, you know, drop Shelly off. And he just drives away. Shaw stayed on this phone call for about an hour and then walked home. Shaw now walks home on foot and he falls back asleep. Both Shaw and Gail Bailey will remember both men coming home at around 2 a.m., 3 a.m., and they said that Jaylee's jeans looked kind of soaked, like up to his knees, and that PRC was completely dry, like his jeans weren't wet. But if you remember, when Oza Shaw last left the house with Shelly and Piercy, it was only two of them. They dropped him off at the payphone and then left. Daly was not in the car. The story that the public will believe was that Shelly was out with both of these men, and this is when she was killed. The next day, her body will be found floating near the Indian Rocks beach. As the investigation begins and her sisters identify her because of that ring, well, her sisters obviously testify. They immediately are on the record with that testimony of what happened at night, that story that made complete sense. And they also give police two names, Jack Piercy and James Jim Daly. So now you're thinking, okay, they have the names, they're gonna go to the house, get the rest of this story, and make a timeline of events, and finally get the person that was responsible in prison. Which one is it? Well, they do search for James Daly and Jack Piercy, but both of them decided, just on a whim, to take a field trip. 
Jack, my man, my 30-year-old man who just hung out with a 14-year-old, why use a fake name? Why use an alias on this spontaneous trip that you're doing on a whim, just like every other week, apparently? And what's with the police work in 1980s? What is the talk with the eyes and the eye color? Just like, ask him the right questions, like, why use an alias? What are you hiding? Not like, oh my god, those hazel eyes every time you smile. They turn green. Like, okay. If this was me, and this will, ne this is why I don't do crime. But like, police officers would be like, you know, every time you lose your shit, those eyes turn a shade of green. Those hazel eyes. And like, like, is this relevant? <laughs> what am I doing here? Is this like what you're wasting the tape on? Because <laughs> I'm here for a crime that I didn't commit. Of course, of course. Okay, anything else you want off your chest? Now that they have Jack in custody and are swooning over his eye color, they are trying to get his girlfriend in for an interrogation before the two of them can communicate. And also, before they walk in, the police officers check his rap sheet. Does he have one? What is his criminal history like? Boy, that, that history speaks for itself. We gotta talk about a couple of things. First of all, what the beautiful lady said in the end is exactly where I was gonna lead with this. Like, you gotta always snitch first and then get a lighter sentence and nobody looks at you anymore or you don't get no sentence at all, which isn't what happens in this case. But I, I beg of you, the police investigation in this case, terroristic threat, no, yet again, let's just make sure we brush past that. Like, no, let's just make sure we never are able to find or just look into that. What do you mean terroristic threat against his girlfriend? Nobody's gonna look at that? No, no, we just brush past that. Then they let him with a pocket knife, fuck smoking, inside the interrogation office. That's already criminal. With a pocket knife, what's next? Like, he usually walked in with a gun, couple of, like, little machine guns. It's an interrogation room. I know it's 1980s, but what the actual fuck is flipping that knife? He could kill any one of you. And then, I'm sorry, again, you're a police officer. How do you not see through this bullshit? I understand you want somebody charged for the crime, but he is saying he's petrified of Jim Daly. He's petrified of him. And then the next day he goes on a field trip with him. Yeah, super scared. You sound like you're really trembling for your life. But of course, they have zero forensic evidence. They don't have the murder weapon. They don't have the knife that was used to stab her. They don't have DNA, and the evidence is pretty circumstantial. It is just hearsay. It is pretty much does what Jack said in that interrogation that we witnessed, match what his girlfriend said, and does that sort of correlate with what Shelley's sister has witnessed. Despite of the lack of forensic evidence, though, the police goes ahead and arrests both of them. James Daly was captured in California and extradited to Florida, and both him and Jack were charged with Shelley's murder. We will go back to speak about the trial, but what you need to know is, because of his testimony, Jack got to serve life in prison, and Daly was on a death row. So this is where we go to the beginning of the story, where 10 days after this trial, our detective John Halliday went into prison because he needed a snitch. Inside of the jails, it is widely understood that if you help a prosecutor and the police, if you snitch on a fellow inmate and you say that you have heard them confess, you would earn these different benefits. You can earn a reduced sentence or charges might even be dismissed. On this day, as John is listening in that small room to different people say what they might have heard, he heard no fewer than three inmates come forward claiming that they have heard that Daly was confessing to the killing. Two of them John kind of listened to, and apparently, according to them, they heard Daly in the library say, I'm the one who did it. But it wasn't sounding like very much picturesque, right? It wasn't really giving them enough details. But then a third jailhouse snitch appeared and he said he could place Daly at the scene of the crime and put a knife in his head. And John is there like, okay, say more, no paint a picture for me. This witness was called Paul Skalknik and he was a familiar face around Pinellas County courthouse and jail, to be honest. Skalnik was also familiar with the detective, with John Halliday, because they had worked together earlier, in 1983, when the detective was investigating this triple homicide. 
And Skalnik again just happened to overhear something that sent two men to death row. Because he was a known snitch at this time, he was also held in protective custody, in the single cell shielded from anybody that could do him any harm, because he did harm upon them. Now you hear that and you're like, okay, so he's isolated from everybody else. How the hell did this guy get in contact with James Dale in the first place to hear him confess? Well, apparently, according to Paul, just a few weeks before the jury selection in Daly's trial was to begin, he managed to hear a whole confession picturing everything that has happened that night. Before we dive into that and how this led to further convictions, let's speak a bit about this jailhouse niche, Paul Skalnik. <laughs> Worthless piece of shit. Paul was a southern baby. He was born in Texas in 1949 and adopted when he was young, raised in League City. Completely normal pathway. He started off on the right track, was in school yearbooks, student council, the key club, even voted president of the future business leaders of America. After high school, he went on to New Mexico Military Institute, and then he went on to become a police officer for just over a year. Okay, this is where I need to pause, because I understand American dream bullshit and stuff. I understand, apparently, you can be whoever you want to be in the US. But when it comes to police officers, do you guys do any vetting, like any physical tests? theory tests. Because here, I looked at it because I did master's in criminology, and I looked at, you know, just even the effort that you need to become one, you know, literally like police patrol on the streets, and it's insane. Like, the process is so long, you need to pass so many tests, and I was like, this is too much effort for what, for me to have like 16-hour shifts every day? No, thank you. And then I resorted to customer service, which I need to be saved from doesn't matter. What matters is, if you are vetted, if it takes so long to become a police officer, why are you only doing it for a year? Like, the effort doesn't pay off. Anyways, a lot of things in Paul's life don't make sense. Like, the next one, that he was forging checks on the side, and then, well, the police force kind of caught him, and that is yet another reason why he only did it for a year. He was allowed to resign from the force and started his new career as an insurance agent. By the age of 30, Paul was already divorced twice, and his third wife's kid actually had a couple of not nice words to say about him. It seemed like Paul would be love-bombing her mom, kind of, at the beginning. Basically, just, like, telling her all of these things that he couldn't really live up to, and lying a lot as well. At the beginning, Lisa thought her mother found the most wonderful guy. He would be telling her that she is his princess, and that, you know, Lisa can call him dad. And she was just like, nah, you ain't my dad, though. Like, it's fine. He also said that he was the CEO of Southwest Airlines. And he would be the type of guy to dress in three-piece suits, like, all gold and diamonds, and look the part, and then probably, like, go and sit in a car park or just, like, do his insurance jobs. Or scam on the side. Like, he wasn't the CEO of the freaking airlines, okay? And then, as soon as the two of them would get married, Paul kind of flipped the switch, and he got really abusive. He would beat Lisa's brother, he would be the mother, and he started sort of touching Lisa in an inappropriate way. Yeah, he was also a child molester, Lisa. This guy was everything. That's why I said he was a worthless piece of shit. By 1978, Skalnik was in prison again for passing some bad checks. And by the time he was out, Lisa and her mom were kind of like, okay, so he's not coming home? Like, from prison? No, because Paul was already in Florida, engaged to another woman, just waiting for, like, divorce papers from Lisa's mom for him to get married. You might be wondering, why the hell was he released from prison? He was a repeat offender now. Like, they knew if they release him, he will just continue scamming and getting back in prison. And the reason here is because he's starting being a jailhouse snitch. From my perspective, probably one of the two things happened. Either he realized, hey, I was a police officer, and then he saw this specific case we're going to talk about on the news, and realized 
What police officers always cared about during this period of time is somebody giving them information. He knew how the system worked, so he knew what they would be looking for. And the second bit that I am not really unsure that this never happened was that probably the police officers and prosecutors were in particular looking for jailhouse snitches during this period of time because it was even more feasible to convict somebody over somebody's just witness testimony, but also that they probably looked into the profiles of these people inside of prison and saw that this guy was a police officer. He will be willing to cooperate. So, as Paul is sitting in his cell in Harris County Jail, he has heard about this case that was making the headlines. And that was the case of Moody Park Free. This was a trio of anti-police brutality activists that were charged with inciting a riot in Moody Park in Houston. And this riot left 15 people hospitalized. Now, the riot started because of a murder of Jose Campos Torres in the hands of the Houston police officers. So, on one side, you have Moody Park Free supporters who are clearly seeing this as a frame-up of these free men for the brutality of the police against Mexican-American people. And are not seeing it as the years of brutality against the minorities pushing these people towards this uprising, because, well, the police again killed the Mexican men. But if you are the prosecution in this case, you need to win it. Otherwise, the police officers would end up in jail. And it just so happened that one of the Moody Free, Thomas Hershey, was booked in that jail and placed in the cell near Paul. So, Paul's strategy, because nobody will convince me that this wasn't strategic as hell, paid off, and the prosecution here won, the Moody Park Free were found guilty. Apparently, the jury declined them serving any jail time, but what this meant for Paul was that he received a recommendation to be moved from jail to this work release program, which is usually forbidden for any repeat offenders. And I suppose this, in Paul's head, just validated his action. The best way forward was to always look for the cases that are in the headlines and make sure you help the prosecution. This is when he was released from prison, abandoned Lisa's mom, and moved to Florida, being engaged to another woman. To this woman, he told her that he was an attorney from Dallas and that he's just starting up his business. So, if she could only invest around $3,500 into him so he can start up his law office in this place. And she did. She didn't even learn that he is a complete scam until he actually got arrested on grand theft. He actually got arrested on a completely different charge. So, now he is in Pinellas County. He is where all of this will be taking place, and he is facing five years in jail. And this is where Paul really would transfer what he was doing on the outside, on the inside of the jail walls. And that is that he would turn snitching really into a business for him. During the 1980s, he would actually pay a phone call himself to the police station, and he would start liaising with around 11 prosecutors during his time, like, on and off, in and out of prison. Because I feel like he knew, as soon as they release him, he's gonna just, like, get married again, commit crime again, and land in prison. And he didn't really like spending time in prison, but he liked having privileges and then, you know, getting off on probation and shit. So, what better way to start doing that than forming a working relationship with the state attorney's office? But what we can't neglect to mention is how beneficial this was for the prosecution. For example, in this particular case of grand theft, 10 days before his case went to trial, Paul decided to provide them with information on three different defendants that were charged with murder, but the cases haven't yet gone to trial. Sort of to seal the deal and help the prosecution win that case. And because of that, the court said they would recommend that he spends three years in jail instead of five that he was supposed to be in there. But they said if he forms this working relationship with them, if he continues snitching during those three years, you know, maybe those three years become two, become one, maybe even probation. 
So the prosecution was kind of like dangling the carrot in front of his eyes and they wouldn't really recommend the exact sentence. They wouldn't really recommend how much they would reduce it to, or if they will give him a probation until he just shows how useful he can be, which was just encouraging to this newfound jailhouse snitch to snitch on everybody in his vicinity. This also meant something else, which is one other reason upon everything I'm saying in this video why I don't believe in the justice system in the US or anywhere, for that matter. He was busy, okay? He would be testifying in two different drug trafficking trials, in one murder trial, just like in a space of a couple of months. He just always happened to be placed in a cell or in a canteen nearby somebody confessing to a murder, which they have done. Which also, if you have watched Christina Randall's videos, okay, Christina Randall, I love you, I'm your baby, this is not what happens in jail. You don't just voluntarily offer up and say what you are there for, what you are in for, nor do you actually say how long you are in for, because somebody will always try to mess it up, like in this case, and say that you have actually confessed to something, or because somebody will try to get you to serve more time. Because why would you serve a lot less time than then? Somebody's gonna try to set you up in one way or another. So just the fact that he was doing this was very much just the product of his imagination, like the girl in the back here, okay? It's just a product of imagination. But what this meant was that every time Paul would show up in trials, because the prosecution would not promise him the reduction of sentence, they wouldn't agree on paper, they wouldn't tell him how long he's gonna serve, or rather how much shorter his sentence would be, he could actually honestly answer that part. Is he getting anything in return? Is he confessing to this because he's promised a reduction in sentence? So under oath, every time he would say, no, I'm just this honest person that has heard a confession and wants to put this guilty person behind bars. During the drug trafficking trial, for example, he said that the accused midway through this trial just happened to strike up a conversation with Paul and utter these words, we were loading the boat with 24,000 pounds of marijuana in Colombia. Which, if you ask me, a bit too precise, I bet there was something to do with that number that the police knew the information on and that suddenly they leaked to Paul Skalnik to offer up that exact number at trial. But this worked. He was rewarded in June of 1982 when he was sentenced to probation only. When it comes to his time in prison, because of course he will return to it as if it was his good friend every couple of months, between 1981 and 1987, Paul testified or supplied information in at least 37 cases in Pinellas County alone. 18 of those cases where he provided information and testified against were charged for murder. Majority of cases would end up in convictions or plea deals, and four people were sentenced to death. And every single time he would get released, he would go back to his old tricks. He would find a woman, either marry her or start dating her. As I mentioned, he married eight times and was almost about to marry a ninth wife when he was arrested one final time. But he would marry a woman, tell her that he's opening a certain business. After that attorney office stunt, he pulled a travel agent stunt and asked for this woman for $5,000 to lend him. A couple of times he actually managed to convince women to give him money in order for him to buy cars. And then when these cars would be repossessed and when they would catch him for stealing that money, he would land in prison again. If this all landed in fraud, it still wouldn't be laughable ever because of what he was doing when he was inside of jail. But I'd be like, okay, he is stealing money. He's a scammer. Yes, apparently you don't see that he belongs in jail for that, but sure. But it was never just about scamming and just marrying one wife after the next. He had a couple of molestation charges, as in child molestation charges. In 1982, this little girl, whose name I won't mention in this video, was 12 years old, and Paul just showed up in the neighborhood. He was like acquaintance of a neighbor, and he kind of summoned her to his car, 
And when she was there, he pulled her in and started kissing her, the 12-year-old, on the mouth. Then he grabbed her hand and put it to his pants area. Luckily, this girl meant business. She was like, I ain't about all of this. I know that this is wrong. So she reported it to her parents who reported it to the authorities. And if convicted here, he would have gotten 15 years in prison. But here, he passed the polygraph, and even though there were witnesses, even though he himself told somebody within the jail walls that he is responsible for the crime, he himself snitched, because there wasn't enough evidence and because of the relationship that he had with the prosecution office, he got off scot-free. He didn't serve a single day for this. Now, with him not getting any time in prison for the child molestation charges, he still had to go to trial because of the grand theft, because of that travel agency money that he stole, and also he managed to convince people to give him $20,000 for the cars, and then he just disappeared with the $20,000. So, those people brought him to court. But now, well, first of all, that jury probably 99.9% was not aware of his child molestation charges, because this was a different trial. So, of course, without that, you can kind of find leeways, I guess, if his attorneys were decent. But also, because of the relationship that he had with the prosecutors, he only got five years. And he also didn't go to prison again. Watch Christina Randall's videos. Prison is for more serious offenses. He should have gone to prison. And longer time served, again, something that is definitely over a year. But because of these connections, he stayed protected and he stayed in the Pinellas County Jail, which is where we meet him again now that our boy John Halliday is here to hear, did maybe, maybe Paul Scully hear anything about James Daly confessing? I can't really tell you how this conversation between John and Paul went. I, I wasn't there. But Detective John and Paul worked on cases in 1984, so just a year before, and he already went above and beyond for the little snitch here. He already helped him get his sentence reduced before. So, on this occasion, just based on what happens next, John probably kind of dangled the carrot in front of... Why am I using carrot as a reference here multiple times during this video? I don't know. He gave him a bit of a bait. He told him that he is going to speak with a parole commissioner. He might even get him on probation, you know, instead of the five years that he has to serve now. If he just happened to hear Daily confess... And after hearing this, or whatever really John said, he might not have said anything at all. Maybe Skalnik just volunteered this, because he knew how popular this case was, and he knew exactly what happened. Well, according to Paul, Daly called him over to his cell and told him, no matter how many times I stabbed her, she wouldn't shut up. Sounds like a natural flow of a conversation, just like bringing somebody up in a jail, like... You don't know the context. You don't know what I'm in here for. But let me just confess to this crime. Like, yeah, I I stabbed her. Like, sir, this is a checkout inside of Tesco's. (laughs) Sir, please move on. There's people queuing up. Like, Jesus Christ. Daly would later go on to say on the record that he never met Paul. Like, their cells weren't even close by. And if you remember, Paul was protected in this jail. He had his own personal cell and would probably just go out, I don't know, to shower or to, like, canteen. So, for Daly to just start up a conversation with this guy that he never met and then snitch on himself, it'd be dumb as hell. But this is where these two worlds collided. And at the time, Paul was desperate to get out of prison again. He would do anything that the prosecution wanted him to. And because of his police career, and by now, really more of a career as a jailhouse snitch, a longer, more successful business that he has started here, he knew how to find the perfect scapegoat. Now, let's speak about the trial that convicted Percy and Daly. Two of them were tried separately, Percy going first in 1986, And the jury here convicted him quickly, but they recommended life in prison instead of a death sentence. During Daly's trial, they used those two other jailhouse informants, but then Paul Skalnik took the stand, and he really went in for a descriptive account of events, 
According to him, yes, Daly found his cell and struck up a conversation with him. But Paul really hit the empathy chords with the jury. He really started saying how this is so hard to comprehend. Somebody's just laughing and having the time of their life inside of prison. And then in the same breath, he's cold-heartedly describing how he stabbed this 14-year-old to death. He said, I had seen this gentleman walking in the hallways, laughing and kidding with other inmates. And all of a sudden, to see a man's eyes and to describe how he can stab a girl. And she was screaming and staring at him and would not die. Then he said that Daly apparently confessed that he stabbed Shelley and then threw the knife away. Which is why, among so many reasons, I believe that somebody was feeding him information. Whether it was John Halliday, whether it was prosecution, whoever really it was, somebody was giving him the inside information that only a criminal would know in order to incriminate Daly. The point that Daly would make later among the fact that he never ever met this guy was that for this to happen, James would have had to gone out of his way to go to Paul, who was either by himself in this cell or was surrounded with some guys playing cards, which would mean that there would be other people that would overhear this. This is a jail, like all of these cells are crammed one next to the other. How come that nobody else, like right next to Paul Skalnik's cell, came forward to confirm this? Or the guys that were surrounding him at the time? How come it's only Paul that has this very descriptive account of events? The nails in this coffin were, yet again, the fact that the prosecution made sure to explain to the jury that Paul isn't getting anything out of this. Like, he isn't getting a reduced sentence, he is gonna still serve his time in jail, and nothing was promised to him. And also that James Daly's defense didn't allow him to go on stand and actually tell him about the Frisbee story, that he that's why he went into the water. Because they just thought, like, the jury won't believe it. And what this has done is to make the jurors that, well, these are the only words that have supposedly come out of Daly's mouth, the one that they are hearing from Paul. That was actually the only information that we ever got that supposedly came from James Daly because he never took the witness stand. So everything, if we were to believe what the snitches were saying, that was the only way we could hear James Daly's voice. So where they stood now, so where they stood now is that Piercy got life and Daly got a death penalty. And right after this trial, John Halliday writes to the parole commissioner about Paul Skalnik, and he says he has never done this in the 10 years of his career. Because of this, five days after the trial, Paul was released on bail, and he had to appear later that year, in October that year, for his trial for the grand theft. But Paul decided to skip town on this occasion. He went back to another state that he was familiar with. He went back to Texas. And here he decided his new character is going to be called Jason Paul Born. Do you attach to your name, mate? Or did you attach to your name? Trying to make it realistic? I know what you're doing here. But then just invent the whole different name. Not the one that's based on books that are going to become movies. to even look like Matt Damon. Anyways, he claimed that he is this oil tycoon, that he is working in the oil industry, and that he's loaded. He would start opening bank accounts and promising that millions of dollars would be wired in to these people. He was back to forging checks in order to buy $27,000 of jewelry. And of course, he got married and divorced to his sixth wife. It took police almost two years, like a year and a half, to catch him in 1998 and extradite him back to Florida where he was booked again in the jail that he was always at. And this is when, because he skipped town, because the prosecutor started kind of suspecting that they can't trust him anymore, maybe not all of his testimonies were really correct. Well, they turned on him, which of course meant Paul knew this game by heart. He now turned on them. And he started a lawsuit against those 11 prosecutors. This story is fucking getting wilder by the minute. So with the help of the public defender, he offered up names of the 11 prosecutors that were feeding him the information. 
Now, either because prosecutors were breaking it, or because Paul couldn't really offer up too many details here, because you can bet that they were also protecting their ass a lot during those years where he was snitching, Paul only got to serve seven months on the bail jumping charge because he skedaddled, and he was released again. So he goes back to Texas, gets married for the seventh and the eighth time. Like, all of his marriages lasted, like, a couple of months. And also how... It's always the ugliest ones. It's always the ones with, like, the face that you look at and you're like, I want to bomb in my mouth. Like, how are you getting these ladies? Like, mm. Well, one reason might be because, again, he develops a character. So he goes into this character and on this occasion he was the estate developer. If you ask me for a job description for even my job, I'd be like, not really sure about everything I'm supposed to be doing here, let alone somebody else's job. This man f went for like 10 careers in like 20 years. I'm trying to escape the reality of the situation because this story gets even grimmer, because guess what happens again? No, no, just, just guess for a second, because they kept releasing him for prison and because they kept hushing away the fact that he is a child molester. Yeah, the woman that he married next, yet again, not gonna mention a name, but he started molesting her daughter, the daughter of his eighth wife. Again, same principle, love bombing, love bombing, amazing guy, amazing guy, they get married, he starts beating the mom and molesting the child. Now, because he is in Texas, when this family reports him in 1993, he does get arrested. And here, they don't know about his record with prosecution and all of that back in Florida. So here he gets 10 years in prison, out of which he served nine. He was out in 2002. As soon as he gets released, he again goes into a character, this time an attorney, starts forging documents and scamming money out of people. He gets caught for it, he pleads guilty, he serves some time in state prison, and then flees the state around 2009. For the next six years, he will be living in East Texas under the name E. Paul Smith. <laughs> Just switch it up a bit, but make sure Paul is in there, sir. Here, he claimed to be an attorney, an undercover Homeland Security agent, ex-fighter pilot who was shot down over Vietnam, and also a terminally ill cancer patient. He was scamming people by writing their wills and doing legal work for them, getting them to invest money, to which nobody saw any returns. Finally, this retired U.S. Marshal senior inspector starts investigating him in 2015, after the daughter of one of his friends figured out his real name and figured out that he has a criminal record and that he should be on the sex offenders list. This is when it came to light that his supposed marriage to the ninth wife that he married there was a sham, like it was a fake marriage certificate, and law enforcement was finally informed due to this marshal. When he was finally arrested in October 2015, he had over 30 fake IDs on him. He had a fake law school diploma with the words E. Paul Smith, attorney at law. Also, don't forget, he was actually arrested because he failed to register as a sex offender. Yeah, that part that we keep neglecting in this story. Like, how did it take you this long to catch up with a man? Of course, as soon as he got arrested now in Texas again, he started chatting up with the lawyers. Like, I could be of use to you inside this prison, you know, like, let's figure out this business. And they just were having none of it. They were like, who the fuck are you? We have never heard of you, mate. Like, also, you failed to report as a sex offender, that part. Like, we take this thing seriously down south. We take this thing seriously. By the time ABC News caught up with Paul, it was beginning of 2020, and he had just been released from the time that he had served in prison for sex offender charges, which means he served less than five years. He told ABC that he never lied on the stand, at least to the best of his knowledge. Sounds a bit sus, my man. He said he won't retract what he said, and whatever he testified to in any of his cases was fact. And then proudly, he turned around and told to the journalist, I never lost a case which is truly what this was all about in the first place, wasn't it? Paul died two months after that interview, so in March 2020, and even on his deathbed, he said that everything he confessed to was true. 
When it comes to where this case is now, Daly, of course, appealed multiple times. He appealed upon the ineffective assistance of counsel, prosecutorial misconduct, the fact that they didn't have him speak at his own trial. That was why the counsel was ineffective in his case. Oza Show and Jack Piercy changed the testimony multiple times. I just don't understand. This is why you can't rely on this kind of evidence. Oza actually said that now he remembers only Piercy entering the house by himself. That when he first woke up, it was only Piercy that entered the home. It wasn't Piercy and Daly. The court refused this appeal because even with it, Shaw still stuck to his original statement about the two of them then coming home later with the wet pants. And also they had two other testimonies by jailhouse snitches. It wasn't just Paul Skalnik's. And another thing when it comes to the ineffective counsel, Daly said that what they never brought up at trial was that 18 days before it, he was moved to the block where Paul Skalnik was and that he said, like, get me out of there, this looks like a setup. Why am I being moved in here where there's a known jailhouse snitch? More importantly, that this is documented, that there are logs in history on paper that can prove this. And, well, if you look at that combined with Paul's previous history of snitching within jail, you know, it creates a picture for the Court of Appeals. Daly was supposed to be executed on November the 7th, 2019, but this was postponed because Jack Piercy wanted to give another statement. He provided a signed declaration that he alone killed Shelley, saying James Daly had nothing to do with the murder of Shelley Boggio. But then Piercy would go back on his words and he would retract the statement and say that he has done 35 years for a crime he didn't commit and he doesn't plan to testify against somebody else so that state can kill them. So he is just as unreliable as he was in 1985. And where this stands now is that the stay of execution for James Daly expired on December the 30th, 2019, and he again appealed for a retrial, and now his appeal is pending with the United States Supreme Court. I will put a petition. I only found one on change.org on James Daly and whether or not his case should be reopened and he should get a retrial if this story possibly convinced you that he was innocent. I don't know what you're gonna think about this one. I think people will be conflicted when it comes to this story because, yet again, there are things that don't make sense. Playing frisbee, going into water for that frisbee, going on a trip to Miami the next couple of days. But then, as I always say, one story does flow better and it's not Jack Pierce's story. And here, just like in so many stories, because of so many characters, because of Paul Skalnik being a jailhouse snitch and everything being about him, because everything being about Jack Piercy and his changing statements, we forget again and again that the real victim is Shelley and Shelley's family, who have to appear at all of these court hearings because they want to know whether or not wrong men have been imprisoned, because they want to know who has done this to Shelley. So, 35 years later, on that hearing when Jack Piercy changed his statement again, Shelley's sister actually approached the judge and she said, our family has been through enough. It will be 35 years this May. It needs to come to an end. We are tired of hurting. We're done. Please get this to an end. When looking at the bigger picture, in some states in the US, there is now a greater scrutiny to jailhouse informants. From 2017, if jailhouse snitches are used in court in Texas, the prosecutors need to keep track and disclose any information on the benefits the jailhouse informants might have received for their testimony, as well as their criminal records and previous cases in which they testified. In Illinois, from around 2019, judges need to hold pre-trial reliability hearings in order to evaluate if informants are getting any benefits, whether they were promised anything, and also their histories. Connecticut is the first state where they have enacted a tracking system for jailhouse informants that documents where and when those witnesses have previously testified and what benefits they received in return. And that is truly where this case stands now.
the family still believes the right people are behind bars or that the court and the police should actually do their job and get the right person behind bars. Skalnik did shitload of damage, shit ton of damage to so many people, four of them on death row, like... This man was something else. And Daly always remained his innocence in Shelley's case. So that is the case of Shelley Boggio, Paul Skalnik, James Daly, and Jack Piercy. And boy, this one is a tropistic. Listen, I work in startups. And even freaking startups have better processes than apparently the court systems in America when it comes to jailhouse informants. All of these articles make it seem like we should applaud these states for, like, you know, making some official changes in lawmaking when it comes to jailhouse informants. It's 2021. When exactly have we decided, no, we are gonna put these criminals in prison, yeah? On child molestation. And then we're gonna take their word for it. We're gonna trust them 30 plus times, never track them, never track if they were actually in that part of prison, if this makes any sense, if there's anybody else to collaborate this. Maybe we have CCTVs now, we have audio, we have video, we can maybe confirm shit like this and then not trust them if they have testified in 30 plus other cases because they're not reliable, because they lied. No processes? Nah, let's not have a procedure. Let's not have like A, B and C on this. No, let's trust one man to put 30 plus people behind bars, put some of them on death row purely on his words, purely on his imagination, as if he's running a freaking fake crime YouTube channel and not, like, playing with people's lives. Let's do that, yeah. Why the fuck not? And never forget... Yeah, no, I, I'm not done going off. No, I, I haven't finished going off. Never forget that the prosecutors and the police were benefiting here, because with the police, clearance rates are what matters, right? It matters how many people you put in prison every freaking year. Prosecutors benefited because conviction rates counted in their instance. And none of these points, nor the benefits that these snitches were getting, were made clear to the jurors. And yes, that might seem obvious to you and me who are, like, freaking obsessed with true crime and who watch so many of these channels, but you can't just suppose that this is obvious to every single juror. There's 12 people of completely different backgrounds, possibly different nationalities, possible different familiarity with the justice system. You need to make it clear to them. You need to showcase the history of the people that are sitting there and testifying. Seems pretty obvious, doesn't it? Now, I'm gonna go exit this video <laughs> and calm down and then sit back here and record another one. Another break for tapas? Let's do it, let's do it. If you don't know what I'm on about, just stay for the takeouts and outtakes timestamp. Yeah, I go off a lot there. You witness all of my breaks and all of my breakdowns there. And don't forget to like and subscribe this kind of video for more content like this. And if you want quite literally more content on this topic, don't forget to like and subscribe to the podcast channel. You know, like and subscribe doesn't really roll off your tongue. Do you want to work in customer service forever? No? Okay. Then say it. Like and subscribe. Practice. Practice for next time. I'm working customer service forever. Do you want... Would you rather do this? Good. Good. Then practice. Okay, now we go. Today was chaotic. <sighs> bye. <laughs> and bye out. <laughs> because this doesn't need to be any more chaotic than it was. Okay, bye. Did you choose to speak about him because he's as obsessed with his first name as you are? Wait, I, I think I think the girl in the back wants to say something. What was it, girl in the back? eye-roll moment? No, I chose to talk about this guy because his story is super interesting. <laughs> Did I think the putting on the bottle of the ground? <laughs> he has had almost nine wives and for a substantial amount of time in his life he even went under the name Jason Bourne. Yeah, he thought he was Matt Damon. You think it's just 
because he's as obsessed with his first name as I am. I mean, he did go under Jason Paul Bourne. <laughs> So yes, that might be a bit of a part of why I chose to talk about this guy, but don't let it get into your head, girl in the back, okay? You don't know me. You don't know me like that. I actually do know you, because this is not a KT Ups video. I am you. I am a product of your imagination. <laughs> Okay, then, a bit debatable, but good Katia preference there, good one, good one. <laughs> the same instant that I start making profit out of this channel, enough for me to be able to live in, and maybe, maybe, just weekly, pay somebody to edit these videos. They're getting edited by somebody else. Jesus Christ, can't nail us out, sit here every week for like three videos. Sorry, mommy. <laughs> Who the fuck do you think you are? Just screaming at yourself like you're the mom character, the girl in the back. How many characters can you have in your head? A lot. Not to mention my fantasies at night. Well, <laughs> the men in my head are like living a completely different love story. Wanna share more on that? The Taylor Swift like fucking love story? Just say yes! You have just lived like about 10 lives within the past 10 seconds. You went from like 28 year old Maya to 15 year old freaking Maya when Taylor Swift released Love Story. Was that 15? Wow, Swift has got a career on her. Yeah, something you don't know nothing about. And mic check, part 55. I think I'm gonna stick with this. I, I don't, I need to like, you see, professional people know what they're doing in post-production. Also, I'm sorry, the fact that there's a pimple here because of masks and it looks like my face is swollen on this side. I cannot even have an attractive pimple. My attractive people have attractive faces even when they have a pimple. What conclusion does that lead you to? I need to finish with this mic check so I actually start recording. <laughs> what I need you to do is to go on Google reviews and review your eyebrow lady. Look at that. She fucked me up. Nice. For the first time ever, they're actually like equal. They look like they belong on the same face. Respect the trade. Respect your eyebrow lady. Listen to me right now. Go on Google reviews and review the lady that does your eyebrows. Okay, where was I in the script? <laughs> Do you understand why the 2020s are like my favorite thing? The amount of fillers, like the most important thing. How do we say that differently in just another sketch so that it doesn't sound completely... What you need to understand, what is really important to understand. <laughs> How many times can you say important? How many times can you put an emphasis within like three lines? It's like every single line. Like the most important thing in this case. I just need to drill into your head. It's so important. I love the fillers. I love the fillers in 2020. All of these 2020 documentaries could truly be like 20 minutes long. Just like this video, right? <laughs> Go. If you wonder why my lips might look orange, uh, I just stood up in the middle of this video, I was just done with Paul for a bit and his freaking shenanigans, and I had the tapas break, you know, a bit of a tapas break, chorizo and like a little salami, and then I put ketchup on it. That was it. Just chorizo, ketchup on it. Cheap people, things. Mm, 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 mm. Cheap people get me right. Why is this camera? Why is literally like only my forehead in here right now? Okay. Are you gonna get food this month? <laughs> Are you okay today? Why is this so chaotic? You know what? I know I'm an immigrant. I'm not American, neither am I British, but I have been a witness in a trial here once, and also I just research these cases weekly, multiple cases a week. It's not even laughable anymore for me how shit like this can fly in a trial. I just don't understand, like, have none of the jurors ever in these cases heard of a single true crime case? Like, how can you convict just based on a jailhouse snitch testimony? How can you convict without, like, zero evidence? It's truly about which attorney can spin a better story. And this isn't a YouTube video, okay? This isn't Suits, Law and Order. This isn't a TV show. It seems to me as if they're just playing with people's lives. It's like, oh, we lost, okay, fuck it, he'll appeal, or he is gonna go to the electric chair, one or the other. Based on what? Based on nothing, you're sending people to the electric chair. That's the beef that I have with the US when it comes to the death penalty, because that's truly, like, you need to have some evidence, at least. Can't commit somebody to a death penalty based on hearsay. Like, are we hearing each other? These jurors are like... 
I mean, F death penalty, fuck it. He wasn't, he didn't take a stand. We could only hear his words through the mouth of a jailhouse snitch. Yeah, see. Can we talk for a second about how suave this 2020 presenter is? The real reason why my addiction to 2020 is substantiated. Because all of them are hot. Like, the lady that is in most of them, so hot. A lot of plastic surgery, so hot. Okay. Okay, well, I'm there for the content, okay? You know it, you know it. I'm gonna do a mic check with like different system checks. So girl in the back, you got me, yeah? You got it. She knows. She knows. And I know she knows. And I know she knows. <laughs> she knows. She knows. And I know she knows. Okay, you failed there with the girl in the back. You didn't really include her there. She's still a product of your imagination. Let's see how this sounds like. Okay, go in the back. Get it, get it, get it. Can you tell I spent all of my free time on freaking TikTok? 